at this clinical history now. A two-year-old boy is brought to the hospital by his mother after she was terrified seeing significant fresh blood in his stools today morning. The boy is comfortable now with pulse of 70, blood pressure of 180, 82. So pulse is normal, no tachycardia, blood pressure is normal. He has no fever, pain or vomiting, no clinical you know, symptoms. So signs per abdominal examination reveals a soft abdomen without any tenderness with good peristalsis on auscultation. Well, then why did he have fresh blood in his tools that to a significant amount? USG abdomen was done to find out that particular, you know, detail, but the USG turned out as normal. A technetium per technate study was done and is shown here. What is the most likely diagnosis? Well, the examiner is desperately trying to help you out here. How? By giving you a series of clinical details then telling you that the USG was normal, then telling you that a technetium per technate scan was done, right? He is literally trying to spoon feed you the answer. He wants you to choose the most appropriate diagnosis. Let us approach this particular uh, question in a step-by-step -step manner. Let us do a clue hunt. I said a lot of clues your examiner is giving you here, right? When the examiner gives you so many clues, you have to cling on to these clues because they are going to take you one step closer to the diagnosis. So, what are the clues? So, a two-year-old boy, a condition which can you know, particularly be seen in the pediatric age group. He is brought to the hospital by his mother. Why? Because there was significant fresh red blood in the stools. So, the clinically, the boy is not having any fever, no pain, no vomiting. The abdomen is soft, no tenderness, good peristalsis, USG was normal. And a per technique study. Each of these, believe me, is a clue, right? How? You know, so if we try to look at the diagnosis, believe me, each of these diagnoses, you know, is associated with certain clinical findings. Acute appendicitis will typically present with severe pain in abdomen, where in the right iliac fossa with tenderness at the McBurney's point, it is not seen here. Into susception can present with blood in stools, right? Red current jelly stools, isn't it? But then intussusception is also common in the pediatric age group. But then when there is intussusception, you know, the child usually presents with severe episodic cramping pain. Once the intussusception, you know, gets reduced by itself, the child is well, right? Here there was no pain, no vomiting at all. The abdomen is soft. If the intussusception persists, it can sometimes be palpated as a mass per abdominally, but not always. Here there was nothing palpable, no tenderness, no pain at all. Acute gastroenteritis should present with loose motions, vomiting. There was nothing of this sort here. So what we are looking at, right, is a painless, is a case of painless, acute, lower GI bleed, fresh blood in stools, right, without any signs of infection or inflammation. Now, if we consider these as we just discussed, right, acute appendicitis will present with severe pain in the RIF. There will be tenderness at the McBurney's point. Intussusception, when the intussusception occurs, will also present with severe pain, right? There will be blood in stools, which typically presents as red current jelly stools right here there was no pain right acute gastroenteritis should present with fever occasionally it should present with loose motions there was there was no history of any loose motions here it should present with vomiting there was no vomiting here so if we rule out these options what remains is a diagnosis of meckels right Another clue which was there in that particular question was a particular scan which was done, right? If you remember the name of the scan, what was the name of the scan? It was technetium 99 labeled per technate scan. Per technate scan. This particular scan, when it gives a positive result, is specific for a diagnosis of Meckel's diverticulum and therefore it is sometimes also called as a Meckel's scan. So, what is the test which is done for Meckel's, you know, diverticulum detection? It is Meckel's scan or technetium 99 per technate scan. What is the concept? Why is this scan done? Now, this agent that is per technate has a particular property when used for GI tract purposes is that it 
gets localized to the gastric mucosa so what happens because it gets localized to the gastric mucosa see here can you see that there is a significant uptake in the stomach but can you also see that there is a significant uptake here as well in the mid and lower abdomen what is this here this is nothing but the urinary bladder that is how the agent is excreted out but what is this focal uptake that you see in the area of the mid abdomen what is this i said that this agent pertinate has a property of getting localized to gastric mucosa so why has it got localized here in the mid abdomen is because this is a structure which has ectopic gastric mucosa so meckel's diverticulum has ectopic gastric mucosa within it and therefore this pertinate when it gets localized to gastric mucosa it gets localized into the stomach as well as in the meckel's which has ectopic gastric mucosa and that is how this technetium pertinate scan or meckel scan helps us detect the presence of meckel's diverticulum another important clue another important clinical pearl that we have learned here is why is this particular patient presenting with significant fresh red blood in stools or lower gi bleed because of there being ectopic gastric mucosa in the meckel's what is the function of gastric mucosa the function of gastric mucosa is to secrete acid when the acid is secreted in the stomach right it is able to tolerate that acid because see, this stomach has been made by nature in such a way that it can tolerate acid can small bowel mucosa tolerate acid no so when this ectopic gastric mucosa in the meckel's diverticulum secretes acid it causes significant damage to the adjacent small bowel mucosa this leads to gi bleeding in fact lower gi bleeding remember is one of the most commonest clinical presentation of meckel's diverticulum occurring in the pediatric age group so in children how does meckel's diverticulum present most commonly it presents with lower gi bleed so with all these clues if we consider together so a child with fresh blood within these stools right he is otherwise comfortable per abdominal examination does not reveal any finding because the meckel's is not yet inflamed it is not meckel's meckel's diverticulitis it is a meckel's diverticulum and its ectopic gastric mucosa and acid which is going to cause lower gi bleed here right and a technetium pertinate study is able to pick up this ectopic gastric mucosa and hence in this case the answer is meckel's diverticulum yes what is the management of meckel's diverticulum well initial management as in this case is usually conservative management why because it is known to be a self limiting condition it usually does not cause recurrent bleeds however if this fails and there is recurrent bleed then selective angiographic selective angiographic embolization can be done right so selective angiographic embolization will you know into the distal branches of the superior mesenteric artery which is going to supply the meckel's diverticulum if it is done then this bleeding can be arrested but if this you know continues to recur there's something that is definitive management which is required and the definitive management is meckel's diverticulectomy that is you remove the meckel's diverticulum so that is going to be the definitive management of meckel's diverticulum Yes. Now let us look at certain Meckel pinchers. Right, some important facts about Meckel's that I want you to know. Most common presentation of Meckel's diverticulum in children. Right, we have just studied it is GI bleeding, mainly lower GI bleeding. Right, so most common presentation in children is GI bleeding. Most common presentation of Meckel's diverticulum in adults is usually bowel. obstruction this obstruction can either be due to formation of an into susception where the meckel's diverticulum acts as a lead point at the point of uh, lead point for into susception to occur or it could be due to volvulus of the small bowel around the vital line ligament what is the vital line ligament it is a ligament that you know extends from the tip of the meckel's diverticulum up to the umbilicus so because it is a sort of a band or a ligament small bowel can get entangled around it 
creating bowel obstruction right so this is how the clinical presentation can be different investigation of choice for the detection of meckel's diverticulum when it is not inflamed just presents with gi bleed as we have just discussed is as in this case the investigation of choice is technetium labeled per technate scan right but when it gets infected when it gets inflamed and when we have a case of meckel's diverticulitis then the investigation of choice is contrast and CT because now it is infected inflamed so we can identify it as a blind you know end tubular structure there can be surrounding inflammatory changes which can also be picked up and therefore contrast and CT is the investigation of choice these inflammatory changes are not present in just a case of Meckel's diverticulum right and therefore a technician per technate scan can be done this is one of the best examples of the concept that we have studied in our marrow edition 5 videos and that is when a structural or an anatomic modality like USG CT scan fails Fails, we have to use a functional or a metabolic modality. In case of Meckel's diverticulum, you will not see anything if you do a USG or a CT because such a small diverticulum without any infective inflammatory changes will not be picked up. So when structural or anatomic imaging modalities fail, what we use is a functional or metabolic imaging modality and what is the concept of this technetium per technet scan we have seen it it gets localized to the gastric mucosa rule of two is something which is important about meckel's right so what is the rule of two multiple clinchers point clinchers i want you to know it is seen in approximately two percent of the population the length of meckel's is usually two inches on an average the location is around 2 feet proximal to the ileocecal junction. It usually has two types of mucosa within it. We have discussed one, isn't it? We have discussed that it has a gastric, ectopic gastric mucosa or it could occasionally also have ectopic pancreatic mucosa right so these are few important tools associated with meckel's another important meckel clincher i want you to know is sometimes there could be a hernia see an inguinal hernia with its content as meckel's diverticulum as it con as its content so when there is an inguinal hernia with meckel's as its content then it is given a specific name so it is called as litters Litter's hernia. It is given a name. It is called as Litter's hernia. So these are few important Meckel's clinchers. What we have done in the short session is that we have studied the specific clinical presentation or a scenario with which a Meckel's diverticulum can present. We have discussed the concept related to the workup of these patients. We have discussed the concept regarding the use of technetium per technate scan, you know, for the diagnosis of Meckel's. And when we have completed this clinical discussion, we have discussed various specific Meckel related clinchers that you need to know for your exams. Friends, I'm sure all of you are aware that there has been a drastic, radical paradigm shift in the way in which your exams are being conducted these days. Gone are the days where one liner simple factual MCQs were asked in your exams. Right, you used to mug up these factuals and then you go into the exam and solve such questions. Those days are gone now. What you are asked now is, you know, specific clinical situations, specific, uh, you know, clinical details, imaging findings are given. You're asked to make a diagnosis or even more, you're asked to comment upon the management. Questions are more conceptual now rather than being factual ones, right? And therefore, I've decided to come up with these clinical MCQ discussion series. Remember, in each of these series, we are going to discuss one such peculiar clinical situation. These are just small steps, I'll say, baby steps towards attuning your minds, you know, or towards preparing yourself in an approach which is truly a clinical approach towards your exam. I believe strongly that small steps that we are going to take here in these series, these are going to give you big, big results in your exams. I hope you enjoyed this session. I'm going to come very soon with a lot many such sessions. Thank you.